Uh, welcome to our afternoon fast pitch session. My name is Paul Albertus. I'm a program director here at RPE. Um, I think as all of you know by now, the purpose of these fast pitch sessions is for us uh, program directors and fellows at RPE to showcase ideas that we're thinking about. Um, the, these sessions are meant to be fun and exploratory. Um, each of us will also make sure we identify where in the overall program development or ideation phase we are. Some, most, most of these um, uh, fast pitches in this session are going to be in the fairly early stages, so before we run a workshop, but there will also be some discussions of programs that have already um, been issued and had kickoff. So each of us will kind of let you know where we're at in the overall process. And so with that, I'd like to get started. i also like to quickly announce that uh, because we started a little bit late today, we're probably going to run until around, uh, we'll finish it by 5.15, but we're going to run past 5 o'clock, so just to let you know. Great, so um, the title of my fast pitch today is Beyond Batteries, Direct Electrification of the Transportation Sector. If we look at ener U.S. energy um, use in the transportation sector, um, we can see it's really dominated by oil. Over 90% of the energy used in transportation is in the form of oil, and of course there's a good reason for that. In many ways, oil is an ideal transportation fuel. Unfortunately, oil accounts for around a third of all U.S. CO2 emissions, and part of the challenge here is that um, the high emissions also stem from fairly low efficiency. So just around 21% of all the um, energy contained in that oil is actually converted to useful mechanical work. And so what I want to do today is explore the use of a different fuel, um, electricity, which currently has a very small fraction or share of overall U.S. energy, uh, transportation energy use. And in particular, there's a lot of benefits from electricity, including high performance, high efficiency, um, both of which derive from the properties of electric motors. Um, the electricity also offers no point of use emissions. and can also leverage uh, an electricity grid that over time is getting cleaner um, through the penetration of uh, wind and solar. And in particular, I want to uh, ask the question, are there technical challenges that RPE could address um, that could help enable new paradigms in the area of a direct electrification? And I have two uh, contrasting images here. The top one is impeccable German engineering, and the bottom one is ad hoc Silicon Valley engineering. And we'll talk more about those as we go on. So when people think about using electricity as a transportation fuel, they usually think about using batteries. And for sure, battery electrification of vehicles has arrived. Um, Tesla has done a great deal to develop vehicles that raise the profile of, of electrification of vehicles. Um, so for example, the Tesla Model S is available today with around a 70 kilowatt hour battery pack or more. This can give you a range over 200 miles, and the cost is around uh, $60,000 after a federal tax break. Chevy Volt um, represents really a second generation of full electric vehicles. This is um, a vehicle that will be released this year. Similarly sized battery pack around 60 kilowatt hours and half the cost. And so many producers, including Tesla, are going after this second generation of low cost full electric vehicles. Um, unfortunately, when you look at what can be done in terms of battery electrification for different vehicle classes, we can see that uh, for a small car, a battery size of say 60 kilowatt hours results in a cost at scale up with the mine volumes of maybe $12,000. And that could be an adequate price point. That's more or less what the Chevy Bolt is, is aiming for. If you look at a large SUV though, you can see that you need about 150 um, kilowatt hour battery pack to go a range for a range of 250 miles. And that would cost you almost $30,000. If you think about doing this with an even larger vehicle class like a semi-truck, Clearly, you're not going to be able to um, afford a battery cost even at, at, low, at high volume with mine production of $130,000. And so there's really, the point here is that um, battery electrification is really best suited for small vehicles. So how far can that get us? Well, if you look at transportation energy use by vehicle class, we can see that more than half of the energy is used in light duty vehicles. But if you break that down further, um, only about half of that can actually be used um, is actually used in, in small light duty vehicles. And of course, there's kind of a fuzzy line of exactly how that might work there. But the point remains that more than half of all of our transportation energy use is not gonna be um, uh, addressed by battery, battery electrification. Now, if we look at um, the use of electricity for larger vehicle classes, of course, there's a long history here of direct electrification. Um, Streetcars have been around for well over 100 years. Uh, we also have public transportation systems that are used today for example, the DC Metro or the San or electric buses in San Francisco. And 
the challenge here is that, of course, there's reasons for the low penetration. And uh, the big, what we might call the dreaded 14-letter word here is infrastructure. Um, these uh, systems need infrastructure development to, to run them and often have a wire or track costs of millions of dollars per mile and up. Um, they have, when you create this kind of infrastructure, you have fixed routes and you don't have the flexibility which is prized in transportation systems. You also need overhead lines or on-ground tracks that will end up limiting access um, um, for, from a variety of different types of vehicles which have, which have to be specially equipped and have special attributes. A second challenge is that um, there's fairly high vehicle costs, so large direct electric vehicles have very low production volumes, and so you also have uh, low production volumes leading to high costs. And so the, the question I want to ask, and again, this is a pre-workshop kind of question, so I'd love to have feedback from you, is can RPE solve technical challenges that would help enable new paradigms that would allow us to overcome some of the challenges that I've just uh, mentioned here? And I'll just give a few examples that I've come across, and I'd love to hear more from you. Um, so, for example, Siemens has developed what they call an e-highway system, which is actually being trialed right now in the Los Angeles area. And what it basically is, is uh, installation of overhead lines that semi-trucks could directly access. And so a semi-truck would retain a full diesel powertrain, and so it would have all the flexibility to go where, wherever it wants, and then automatically dis, um, connect or disconnect from overhead lines whenever it's, it's, it's present there. Um, this has the benefit of leveraging existing vehicle platforms, so it's not a completely customized vehicle. And there could be technical challenges here, for example, in powertrain optimization or trying to um, automate these vehicles. Second example um, that I've come across, wireless power transfer. Um, and the big key point here is that wireless power transfer could enable uh, ground level, safe ground level transport. And so, of course, the existing ground level systems um, require separate tracks that people aren't allowed to go near for safety reasons. If you had safe ground level transfer, you could potentially expand access to a range of vehicle types. Um, you could also potentially make use of add-on receiver technology that would bolt underneath and allow you to use this for a variety of vehicle types. Um, lots of technical challenges here, especially around cost, um, around efficiency, transfer efficiency over a distance, um, and also being able to operate these vehicles at high speed. And so the working principle is shown on the left. It's basically um, induction, magnetically indu inductive coupling. Um, this has been deployed for example, in a bus system in South Korea. And if you think about, back to our original kind of silly picture at the beginning of this Prius that's been hacked to run off the overhead lines in San Francisco, and imagine replacing this long um, connector piece with a wireless receiver that could be shared among different vehicle classes, that would then become a much more practical situation. Uh, a last example, which I think is even further afield uh, and, uh, and futuristic, is the Hyperloop that uh, Elon Musk has proposed. This is basically a vacuum tube system that would allow very high, speed, um, high speeds. And uh, it's one of the very few pathways we could imagine that would allow us to um, replace the oil used in air travel with uh, electricity. And there's tons of te technical challenges here. The overall stage of this is just going from artistic renderings to people thinking about how this could actually work in practice. And so the picture on the rough, for example, is uh, an MIT uh, student group who, who won a design competition for how one of the pods might look. And so just broadly speaking, the, the problem statement that I've tried to lay out here that I'm interested in is what technical challenges could RP address that would help enable cost-effective direct electrification, um, especially of large vehicles that are not going to be well um, addressed by uh, batter, battery electrification, or even more broadly, what can we do that would further the use of existing modes of electric transportation? So again, if you're um, interested, please come talk to me after the fast session today, or feel free to send me an email. And so with that, I'll conclude. Um, we'll do questions at the end. I'd like to introduce a fellow program director, Tim Idell, who will give the second fast pitch. Great. <clears throat> OK, can, can you hear me? Doesn't sound like the mic's on quite yet. OK, great. Uh, so my name is Tim Heidel. I'm a program director uh, here at ARPA-E. And this afternoon, I'd like to talk to you about a hypothesis that we've been working on trying to test over the last year. Um, specifically, I'll focus on one program that we've already announced and that we have already made funding solution decisions for. And I'll hint at another program that hopefully we can share a lot more with you uh, sometime in the future. And that hypothesis is that we believe that there's an opportunity to use competitions to accelerate the development of new grid optimization algorithms 
and pull breakthroughs on the algorithm front out of other industries and apply them to the power systems and grid domain. Now, as many of you will know from visiting the panel session that was yesterday, prizes are a very popular topic and there's an enormous literature on why prizes can be effective and this is just one diagram that you can pull out. And I wanna highlight just a couple features of what people find prizes are really good for. First, it's separating the great from the good and identifying true excellence. It's focusing a community on a problem, on the same problem, and enabling the apples to apples comparison of different approaches to solving it. And perhaps most important, it's identifying and mobilizing new talent from outside the domain that you're specifically trying to work on. Many private and public agencies and organizations have run prizes over the last several years. Um, there was an announcement yesterday here about the Google Little Box Challenge and the winner of that uh, in the power electronics domain. So let's see about how we can apply prizes to grid optimization. So as I, I think as everyone in this audience knows, the grid is this amazing, immense machine. Stretching for thousands of miles, it connects hundreds and thousands of generators, hundreds of thousands and millions of customers. And because we don't have ubiquitous, cheap, efficient energy storage, we have to achieve an instantaneous balance between supply and demand 24-7, 365. In order to do that, over the last 100 plus years of electrification, we've developed immensely sophisticated software and business practices and organizational organiz procedures that have resulted in things that look like this. All over the world, there are control centers that look like this that employ amazingly complex software that will enable us to achieve the efficiency that we all come to expect and don't even think about on a daily basis. And yet, all of the changes that many of you have heard about throughout this conference, renewables and the shift to gas and making customers a lot more responsive and, and giving them a lot more choice, serve to make the problems that these places solve even more difficult those challenges become far more complex and we need new software and new algorithms to solve those new problems. Let me give you one illustration of what this looks like. Um, this is a simplified diagram out of a report that was led by NREL uh, and the DOE a couple years ago. And this is showing, in today's world, a simplified view of how you operate an electric power system. In particular, what generation do you use throughout a one-week period? And so you see pretty clearly you have baseload power and you have intermediate plants and then you have peaking plants that come on occasionally during the day. And when they applied that same simulation study to a future scenario with a much higher percentage of renewables, this picture that looks fairly easy, now remember, when you're trying to optimize a huge portfolio of generators, that problem is already complex. And it turns into something like this. So there's a recognition of the fact that we need these new algorithms, now how do we do it? It's both algorithms and hardware, so let me just take a quick aside. Uh, these are prototypes and projects that you can learn about down on the showcase floor from projects that we've funded over the last several years at RPE, focusing on power electronics, power flow controllers that you can embed within the network to enable you to gain more control over how power distributes itself and flows throughout transmission systems as well as distribution systems. These devices, while they solve that problem and allow you to take a lot more control over how power flows, also make your world more difficult because they're giving you even more flexibility and even more decision variables. So what's the problem that we're trying to solve? We're trying to optimize the way that power flows throughout the grid subject to physical constraints of the infrastructure um, and there have been an explosion of options that have been proposed in recent years. The literature and is full of new approaches that could solve this problem. And really what you're trying to do is you have all of this infrastructure, you have all of these controllable variables. Um, how do you, what signals do you send to every device throughout that whole system to optimize and maximize reliability while minimizing cost and while perhaps even minimizing emissions? That's the problem. So there have been all these solutions proposed. Unfortunately, we really don't have a good mechanism for comparing those solutions to each other to identify the strengths and weaknesses of different possible approaches. And so this is where we came to the point where we said, maybe a prize is the right way to go here. 
Maybe a prize is a way to actually pull out these algorithms and compare them. So what do you need to run a prize? It's really simple, it's three things. First, you need realistic, challenging, benchmarking models and data sets that you can share with everybody. And you can say, everybody apply your particular solution approach or your particular algorithm to this common data set that enables us to compare and contrast across those. You need a detailed and accessible problem definition. You need to tell the world what is the problem that you're trying to solve in a way that is not specific to those who already have 20 years of experience within the domain. You have to make it accessible to as broad an audience as you possibly can. And then finally, what makes this particularly difficult in the algorithm space as applies to energy is often you really care about the time to solution. Not only does the quality of the solution matter, but you need to know how long it takes to solve and how often it gives you a reasonable solution. And so you actually need a computational platform, is the third thing here, um, to enable you to do a fair evaluation of different methods, including time to solution. So we started working on this a year ago, and throughout the past year, we've tried to tackle the top bullet of this, providing and, and funding the development of realistic, challenging benchmarking models. Um, I'll skip this for time, but if you look at the existing models that we have today, they lack a lot of the key details and the key elements that you would want to be able to control in a future system that is far more dynamic than what we have today. And so existing data sets are too small. There's too few of them. They're often incomplete. And so we launched a program last year. We announced the selections for this program in January. It's called Grid Data, and it's funding five different teams to build large, validated, realistic, open access power system models, and also developing the infrastructure that's needed to enable the research community to share those models, to annotate those models, to version control those models, to comment on them, so that the community as a whole can start to co-develop the models by which we will compare all of the algorithms that we're seeking to develop over the next several decades. Now, that solves that first bullet. We need to now go after the problem definition, and we need to go after the platform. We're working on those now. But what I'm here to talk to you about today, which I'll leave you with, is how might we use this mentality of having large-scale data sets that are realistic and validated for other types of energy algorithm problems? Solving the issues of how difficult transmission expansion is, or demand and renewable generation forecasting, or load disaggregation, event detection, classification, asset health and monitoring, it, the list goes on. There's dozens of these I can think of. And what I would love in the Q&A and afterwards and as we circulate throughout tomorrow, um, I'd love your suggestions for what problems should we focus on that might really lend themselves to a competition platform like what I've talked about today. So with that, I will end and introduce my colleague, Sonia Glavosky. Good afternoon all and thank you all for coming. Uh, I am program director who has actually established and who will be managing NODES program. NODES stands for Network Optimized Distributed Energy Systems and this program is really focusing on developing uh, methodologies and technologies that will enable real-time management of transmission and distribution of the power grid to enable uh, larger levels of in renewables integration at minimum 50% would be our goal. So there is no doubt in our minds that consumers are asking for renewables and uh, being a second day of our pay summit, uh, we have heard this theme uh, many times. On average, uh, we have uh, different uh, renewable portfolio standards in 29 states in the United States and on average uh, what people are asking for is 20 to 30 percent renewables by 2030. Some states are ahead of others uh, like California that is asking to go to 50 percent renewables. And what does this mean for the way how we are operating the grid? Tim has touched upon some of the issues but the paradigm of op uh, operating grid basically is uh, fundamentally based on the fact that we at every instant in time we have to balance power generation with the demand. And why we do that? To keep it running reliable to maintain the frequency. And this is based on physics and on the existing mass of all the synchronous generators that you have in the system that help with their inertia. I won't have time to go into that, but what I'm trying to tell you is that we have very well uh, tuned machine where we actually manage it top down. We dispatch bulk generation to manage the lo uh, to match the load. However, these days with introduction of renewables and uh, distributed energy resources, we have 
intermittent distributed generation. Variability is a problem. Uh, we used to have very predictable load, but by attaching all these devices of consumer's choice, like distributed generation, residential, solar, storage, we have variable net load, and net load stands for generation minus uh, any power that you are drawing from storage or generation. We used to have some capacity available to reroute power. These days, when you have renewables at uh, locations where we actually don't have load, we have to transfer that energy, and that is running into some parts of the country into capacity constraint. So if we keep business as usual, uh, we can go up to 30% of renewables uh, in reliable and affordable fashion. And what RPE would like to do is to push that. And what we believe is that by actively controlling net load, we can go to at least 50% renewables integration. And when we were thinking about this program, this was uh, perceived as very revolutionary. I have to say that some of our colleagues on the West Coast are actually seeing this as a mandate, and they have to live with, with that, and we are hoping that we will actually help them. So what we do right now in the grid, we manage it top-down. We uh, dispatch bulk generation, and these are the big synchronous generators that I mentioned previously. We curtail renewables at the bulk level, and this is all to keep this balance that I was mentioning. In some parts of the country, we have demand response uh, programs where we actually shave the uh, peak load to keep the balance again. What we would like to explore is, can we actually actively control net load, everything that we are connecting these days on distribution, to turn the problem makers into actually a problem solvers. Have them be leveraged and have them actively participate in a safe, reliable, and economic operation of the grid. So this is how Nodes came to be. This is a program that has been announced in December of 2015. We had a kickoff in February. And as I mentioned before, our mission is to reliably manage dynamic changes in the grid by leveraging flexibility in the load and distributed energy resources. And I want to emphasize this, that we are trying to see what can provide, what device can provide what functionality to the grid. We're all hung up on storage that deals and manages with variability, but there are other assets that we have there that have some flexibility in the use profiles that we can capitalize on. Technical challenges are basically dispatching both bulk and distributed generation, proactively shaping load over different time scales, coordinating consumers and power generation. And what is actually also at the crux of this program is trying to be, uh, develop technologies that will be able to manage heterogeneous portfolios DR. So we are not looking for technology that will control storage only or water heater only, but something that will actually be a uh, first step in integrating DRs and flexible load in a safe and affordable operation of the grid. We have defined three distinct uh, categories of projects that we are looking. Distinctions are mainly based on the time frames in which we are supposed to provide services to the grid. And uh, we are, if you think about nodes, we are developing two different functionalities. One is trying to develop smarts at the device level that will provide the same functionality that synchronous generators do these days. We basically provide a frequency response to manage frequency of the grid and keep the grid running reliably. Uh, we are looking to different approach as well, where we want to proactively shape uh, ch uh, shape, uh, change the shape of the load, and we do it at two different time scales. Category two is defined that we call synthetic regulating reserves, is basically looking into uh, coordinating lo flexible loads and DERs that can respond in uh, second time frame and sustain their, uh, their desired level uh, for, for minutes. And then for the category three, we are looking at synthetic ramping reserves where we are actually addressing phenomena as California facing these days in, in duck curve, uh, where we would like to coordinate long-term shifting of loads with thermal, electric storage, and non-critical loads. And this is the category where it's very critical that what we developed actually can seamlessly integrate with the way how we operate grid right now and pave the way for introduction of some of these new other technologies that are going to be developed in other, in other uh, categories. So we have a tremendous uh, response to this uh, particular FOA. We have selected 12 teams. Some teams are uh, looking into just one category of the project. Some teams are looking into multiple categories. We have high representation by not only research labs and academia, but also industry, 
uh, system operators, utilities, munis, and why would I even present this? Because it seems like this is a done deal. It's not. We're just starting actually to work on this project. So what we would like to ask you all is to consider perhaps helping us make Node success and join industrial advisory boards of our teams. Some of them already have uh, members of those teams, but we strongly encourage them to actually go explore all the options. Who would be their uh, first customers? Who would be potentially uh, entities that will be licensing technology? And then uh, we would also like throughout execution of this project to uh, not only address technology needs, but also demonstrate novel capabilities in realistic environments. And eventually uh, work with our teams to commercialize, uh, commercialize technologies. And uh, if you have uh, interest in joining any advisory boards, please let us know and we'll direct you to the teams. Thank you. And on this note, I would like to introduce my colleague, Ishi Kiziali, whose program director recently joined RPE. Thank you, Sonia. <coughs> Thank you. Um, Good afternoon. Uh, Earth is a battery, and there is a tremendous amount of heat stored in the subterranean hot rock. Um, mining this heat uh, allows us to reach an energy source that's going to be renewable, continuous, and it's also carbon-free. So none of this is controversial. Uh, what is controversial is is that is it a resource if we can't access it? Um, and are enhanced geothermal systems um, commercially and financially viable? So today I would like to explore with you a, a highly speculative opportunity um, that is also a white space uh, for ARPA-E. And as you can imagine, this is a concept pitch. Enhanced geothermal systems uh, differ from uh, traditional geothermal systems, for example, the ones are in geysers, California, in that uh, in the traditional geothermal systems, the hot rock and the, uh, the steam or the water coexist. In enhanced geothermal systems, the hot rock is deep uh, in, in, in Earth, 3 to 10 kilometers. Uh, deep, and the process is identifying the hot rock, uh, creating an optimized fracture network, and uh, using uh, um, a, a closed-loop water system to extract the heat from the hot rock, take it to the surface, and convert it to electricity. If it succeeds, uh, will it matter, and will it have impact? And uh, I would uh, think that it would. If, if uh, uh, an enhanced geothermal system uh, would be commercially viable, if it was financially viable, the potential could be uh, quite large. And the problem is ARPA-E difficult. So when I look at this map, uh, most of the geothermal resources are um, uh, centered around our western states. So uh, which looks very opposite of the map that Tim showed on the grid. So, <laughs> but uh, uh, the message could be go west, go deep, and find hard uh, rock. There are many uh, barriers to entry. Uh, the levelized cost of electricity in uh, enhanced geothermal systems uh, is estimated from the drilling costs and the drilling success. And we need to minimize uh, the drilling costs and uh, improve our batting average uh, with respect to where we drill, how many times we drill. And this can uh, be possibly achieved by uh, inexpensive identification of the source uh, using data from nanosatellites, drones, robots, and using uh, sophisticated data mining techniques. Uh, information has to come to the surface and, and has to go to the subterranean five kilometers down uh, in very uh, harsh environments, in uh, uh, corrosive environments, high temperature, high pre pressure, uh, vibration environment. And the data, of course, that we're looking for is chemistry, seismicity, um, 
temperature, pressure, and to achieve this uh, extreme electronic devices, optoelectronic devices, the whole in in infrastructure has to be uh, thought out and developed. Uh, these systems have to work at 300 degrees and higher, uh, five kilometers down the earth. And of course, where there's hot rock, it's going to be unlikely that you, uh, the water resources are going to be uh, scarce. So uh, one um, option is looking at supercritical carbon dioxide, which has some very interesting properties as a working fluid. And it's also synergistic with carbon capture um, uh, efforts. So uh, geologists already know this. There are gravitational anomalies, and these can be uh, mapped to geothermal sites. And these maps are generated on foot by making these measurements in, in um, terrain that's not entirely uh, easy, to, 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 um, uh, easy to traverse. So it's also time and labor uh, intensive. Uh, similarly, uh, this data from a European Space Agency satellite demonstrates that the gravitational data and enhanced geothermal resources are correlated, very well correlated, except in this case, the granularity of the data is about 70 kilometers. So can we use low-cost, lightweight hardware uh, and equip uh, much cheaper satellites, nano-satellites, maybe the size of a Coke can, or drones, uh, to, um, uh, to, 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 to pinpoint these um, uh, resources and also use other uh, robotics on ground to narrow this resolution to much less than one kilometer. And what does that instrumentation look like? We also need to think how we construct the electronic, optoelectronic devices, electronic devices, sensors, detectors. These things need to work at 300 degrees, 350 degrees, need to be reliable over the operation of this, uh, of this resource. It could be 10, 10 years, 20 years. Uh, and uh, we have to also think of the, of, the, of the communication network five kilometers under uh, ground. Uh, we're lucky that uh, our uh, colleagues at the EERE uh, Geothermal Office, they're developing uh, such an underground uh, enhanced geothermal uh, system lab uh, led by uh, Lauren Boyd. And uh, we, if we were to uh, pursue this activity, we would be able to, um, we would, we would be able to uh, test our ideas and devices in this laboratory. And lastly, of course, uh, uh, synergistic with carbon dioxide sequestration, uh, we should explore the supercritical carbon dioxide, which has um, which has interesting properties such as uh, higher mobility uh, and, um, and maybe enables uh, more efficient heat transfer to the surface. And um, with that, um, uh, as I said, this is a concept pitch. Uh, I welcome all uh, feedback and input. Uh, and with that, I introduce uh, David Brown, a fellow of RP. Thank you. So, uh, my name is David Brown. I'm a fellow at ARPA-E, and what I'm going to discuss with you is a pre-workshop idea. And I'm hoping that, uh, in this case, it generates a little more light and clarity than heat. Um, so, solar thermal processes have the potential to provide all of our energy needs, both chemical and electrical. They don't. Why not? They're too expensive. So, let's, let's think through the problem. So, if we want to convert something into, let's say, electricity. We take a feedstock, either our smiling sun or our smiling methane molecule. We turn it into heat, and that high pressure and temperature causes a turbine to spin, and that converts it into electricity. So if we look at the cost for these two feedstocks, the sun, solar thermal, is way more expensive than natural gas. And you ask, why is that? Well, it's way less efficient. It's about half the efficiencies. And Carnot tells us that if something's less efficient, it's probably, for a thermal conversion process, operating at a lower temperature. I would say that if that turbine sees a gas at the right temperature and pressure, then 
it will generate electricity at efficiency. So the issue is earlier on, it's in the receiver. So how do we redesign a solar thermal receiver so that it can run a turbine that is 60% efficient? So first, how does solar thermal work? The 101 is you have the light from the sun, which is at 5,000 Kelvin. It hits the mirrors. It's concentrated into a receiver. And that res at this point, you're operating at typically maybe 900 Kelvin. Uh, and that means that you've lost about half of your available energy. So why are you only operating at 900 Kelvin? Why not operate at 1,500 Kelvin? Well, the problem is if I take a material, like the lining of that box, and I heat it up to high temperature and high pressure and run it for a significant period of time, it's going to eventually break. It's not a matter of if, it's just a matter of when. So, of course, I could go to a better material. I could switch from iron alloys to nickel alloys, but then the cost goes up. So I'd like to avoid, I'd like to somehow sub get around this problem of material limitations. So what if I could get the energy inside of that liner, if I could get inside that casing without it actually being absorbed by that casing? So then, in principle, there should be no reason uh, why the heat of the, of the material inside, that working fluid that, uh, that is going to run that turbine, is going to be at the same temperature as the box. And this isn't such a strange idea, because if we look at a natural gas turbine, it operates under these same principles. And so the key component of a natural gas turbine is that combustor. So that combustor is where the chemical energy comes in. So compressed air comes in from the compressor, natural gas comes in, it's combusted, and then it runs through the turbine. And that gas combustor has two technologies that were developed a couple of decades ago which are fundamentally disruptive, and that's fuel injection and boundary cooling. And I think we need to redesign solar thermal so that it takes advantage of those two technologies. So I, I have here a picture of a combustor. I think it's from a Rolls-Royce engine. And so it's got two layers. It's got a shell, which is at nearly ambient temperature, and a liner. There's a fuel injector, so all the fuel is coming in. And the combustion zone is therefore pretty localized. So you are controlling exactly where your heat is. Uh, you have this advantage that if you're uh, flowing chemical energy, it's very dense. You have a very high energy density. So if you're pumping gas, you are pumping about 10 megawatts of energy through your hand. So uh, a moderate size power plant is 100 megawatts. So your standard fill-in station is uh, a full power plant. The second thing that you do is that some of, although some of the air goes directly into that combustion zone, some of it flows around the side and goes through these little holes and then it passes along the surface of the liner and acts to cool it. It acts to prevent the heat of the temper that liner from seeing the same temperature as the combustion gas, and that can result in a 1,000 Kelvin difference between the combustion temperature and the liner temperature. And now suddenly, we've really, uh, you've really broken apart your material limitation. You can use a much more common and cheap material to have a much higher combustion temperature. So the simple idea is why don't we take light and inject it in. Well, that's a simple idea, but it's going to have some very hard technical challenges, and I'm hoping to get feedback from the community on how hard these challenges are and how solvable they are. So the first challenge is you're going to need to concentrate the sun quite a lot. So I said uh, 10 megawatts is a gas pump. Well, even at thermodynamic limit of concentration, you won't reach that with the sun. But the more energy dense you get, the more you're going to be able to localize that region where you're heating the working fluid, and therefore, uh, the, better you, the better you're going to be able to operate that system. The second part is you actually need to take that light and somehow move it uh, into, the, into the receiver. And that means that you're going to need to develop, we need to develop some new advances in optics, both in the optics to take the light and put it into the fiber or any other photonic waveguide, and fibers that are low cost and high enough and can handle a high enough concentration to move the light around. As well as once you're inside the receiver, once the light, that end that is going inside that hot receiver needs to be able to withstand those temperatures for the 10 or 20, 30 years of operational lifetime. Once you have this, you also need to think about system redesign. So I've got a picture of a standard tower solar thermal plant. Uh, so the tower is clearly pretty high up compared to the mirrors on the ground, and that's through the geometry of optics. If you had a fiber, 
there's really no reason that it would need to be that tall. It could just be on the ground. It could be in any scenario you wanted. The fundamental geometric limitations of solar thermal are different when you're piping the light around, and that, I think, will extend to the design of the solar thermal receiver. And finally, I think I'd be remiss if I, I've given this whole concept in relation to electrical conversion, but I haven't really talked at all about the turbine. This idea, I think, could apply as well to chemical conversions, and so I'm looking for ideas of how do you design not only a solar thermal electric receiver, but a solar thermal chemical receiver that can accomplish this. And so I'll end with the challenge. Natural gas is the most efficient way to convert uh, heat into uh, energy into electricity. Um, it's continuing. It's only going to get more efficient over time. Uh, and if solar thermal is going to compete with it, I think it needs to follow that trajectory. Okay, with that, I'd like to thank you all for being a, a patient and kind audience. I know it's been a long day. Uh, and with that, I'll hand it back to Paul for the peer question period. <clears throat> So thanks to all the presenters today. Um, I'd like to encourage all of you to take a look at the screen up here and send in questions that you might have about any one of our uh, fast pitches. And we've got a few in already. I'd like to uh, maybe direct the first one to Sonia. Um, what are some of the uh, opportunities and challenges that you expect to see in getting technologies developed and nodes into actual use in, a, in an electricity grid or in a utility context? We are already facing challenges because what we are specifying in uh, requirements for e all these ca the categories are different validation scenarios. And uh, the challenge is that getting a realistic hardware in the loop simulation with the powered 100 devices seems to be harder than we anticipated. So this is the first thing. And that's, this is why our teams actually reached out and that's why we have high engagement by utilities and uh, power operators because we would like to test actually what are the challenges by integration and developing these functionalities for heterogeneous multiple devices. We have seen pilots being run at different parts of the country, but they typically focus uh, on either one type of DR or they look into flexible load, but never the whole scenario. The other thing is also uh, how is this going to affect development of potentially new business models for, for the utilities and uh, how will the interplay between the two, two develop. But we do actually actively talk to utilities, both from California, from New York, right? we have uh, active participation from utilities from other parts of the country as well. And technical challenges, as I said, how do we actually bring it from the lab to a hardware in the loop simulation and then test it on some of the more realistic systems. Some of our teams actually do have uh, in the project plans tests that will be happening mainly in the Muni environment or in some test facilities that uh, are connected to distribution but not transmission of the, of the grid. Great, thanks. Um, next question for Tim. Um, maybe this is two somewhat linked questions. First one, what's the main research challenges that are being addressed in the grid data program? And the second would be, if there is a prize competition built potentially on top of grid data, what would happen with some of the winning algorithms? Would uh, utilities be able to use them, or what, what's the, where would they end up um, after the competition? Sure. Um, let me take the first one first. I think when it comes to the, the research question underlying grid data, you know, it really comes down to the fact that the, the goal of that program is to create realistic open access models, right? So models that are realistic but don't have concerns around security or concerns around privacy or proprietary details that exist in the world. Um, if you simplify things a lot, you can think of two ways you can do that. On the one hand, you can actually get a real model from an actual utility and apply a wide variety of potential anonymization or obfuscation methods to the point where it no longer has any of those sensitive details and you can get approval for it to be released. Um, and we have had many people tell us that it is impossible to do that and retain the, enough realistic information to make it useful. Uh, the other way you can do is you can actually go all the way to the other end of the spectrum and you can create it from scratch and use uh, graph building methods that are coming out of other industries and create an entirely synthetic system 
and then use statistical methods or other potential methods to morph that into something that actually looks like a real system. And we've had many people tell us that can't be done, that there's no way you can create a system that is realistic enough to be useful. So the real research question is the identification and the development of the methods that you need to actually using either or a combination of those two extremes to give you models that actually can be released but also are sufficiently realistic um, to back actually be valuable to the research community. In terms of the competition, just to touch on that briefly, I think um, you know those algorithms, the role of the competition is to prove what's possible on the algorithm front. And as long as we pick a good problem or a set of problems, and those algorithms are solving you know, very real challenges, there's a wide way, there's a range of ways those algorithms can make, them, make their way into commercial use, from standalone tools that are advisory at first um, to being fully integrated into existing large-scale tools that exist today. Um, and we've had teams that we've funded in the past on algorithm work um, actually explore a wide variety of those potential commercialization pathways. Great. Uh, I think our next question was directed at me. Um, Heavy-duty vehicles can be propelled by fuel cells, and fuel can be generated from electricity. Um, it's not direct, but it's highly flexible. I'd, uh, I completely agree with that comment. Um, there's a whole number of pathways out there that could be used to decarbonize uh, even heavy-duty vehicles. Um, the one that uh, I was laying out today, I think, offers a somewhat unique benefit of also having a very high efficiency. And so if you imagine the hydrogen pathway, which is um, certainly being explored strongly, if you look at electrolysis technologies, you're looking at about 70% conversion efficiency from electricity to hydrogen. You then go into a compression stage or some kind of storage stage, and then run it through a fuel cell, which would be on the order of, say, 55 or 60% efficient. And you end up at a, an efficiency from electricity to uh, electricity in the grid to electricity in a vehicle, which would go to an electric motor, of on the order of 35 or 40%. And so the direct electric offers a pathway to have potentially much higher efficiencies, I'd say probably over 80%. Um, and so that was kind of part of the motivation for looking at that particular pathway. And I think that was uh, pretty much all the questions. I think people are probably getting uh, excited about heading back to the showcase. So I think what we can do is just go ahead and adjourn here. And uh, let's thank all of the folks on stage and thank all of you as well.